Hi everyone, I'm Toby Tucker and I work for FlightAware, uh, the world's leading aviation intelligence company. So I'm based in London and I'm supported by a, a large team in Houston. Um, I used to work in a company called CETA prior to FlightAware, I had great memories there, but uh, excited to be on board at FlightAware and uh, looking forward to this session. Thanks, Anna. Thank you, Toby. And Florian uh, from Sovis, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Florian Eggenschwiller. I'm the Managing Director of Airports at Zovis. At Zovis, we want to help the world reimagine, uh, rethink people flow. And specifically in airports, we help terminal operators understand how passengers move through the building. My background is in ground handling operations, work for different um, aviation support companies in both operational and strategic roles. Thanks to Reboot Aviation for having me today. I look forward to, to a good session. Thank you, Florian. And uh, Christian from Asaya. Yes, hi everyone. My name is Christian. I uh, work as Chief Customer Officer within uh, Asaya. Um, we're an, an AI computer vision company that helps airports, airlines, and ground handlers to optimize their uh, operations, airside operations in special. Before joining Asaya, I worked for eight and a half years at Amsterdam Airport Schiphol in various roles like uh, innovation, but also capacity management. And um, looking forward to the session today. Thanks. Thank you. And we are moving uh, to our agenda uh, to remind a little bit uh, what we're gonna be covering. So uh, we're gonna start with uh, sector by sector analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on aviation and uh, uh, Toby Tucker from FlightAware gonna present this bit. Uh, then we will uh, move uh, towards uh, upcoming capacity crunch in the terminal, uh, which will be covered by Florian from Sovis. And then we'll wrap up uh, with uh, uh, Christian uh, he, from Asaya. He will cover um, post-COVID capacity crunch and disruption of airport operations, which might come. And uh, then we'll have a question and answer session. We'll spend a couple of minutes. Uh, if uh, you will have any questions, please uh, uh, note them down, uh, write them down, and you will have an opportunity uh, to answer them, to uh, ask them uh, in the end of our uh, webinar. We'll have a few minutes on that. So uh, now we uh, basically move into flight aware and uh, Toby will present his part on sector by sector analysis. Uh, please, uh, Toby, to you. Hey, thank you, Anna, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Great. So hi again, everyone. So I'm here to set the scene essentially on what's been happening in the aviation industry through the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to be doing that by analyzing some of the traffic trends we've identified at uh, FlightAware. So we'll look at how these trends have panned out in different geographies, different sectors of aviation, such as commercial passenger flights, cargo flights, business aviation, and some other slices and dices that really help visualize the impact of COVID-19 on aviation. To help with the visualization, I'll be using real statistics that FlightAware captured through its core business of being the world's leading aviation company. So how does FlightAware capture and provide this aviation data to some of the world's leading airlines and companies? Well, the bottom part of this slide depicts how FlightAware captures many different data sets. So we, of course, have ADSB. We also have data link messages, schedules data, flight plans, ATC and swim messages, plus some customer supplied data. We take all that data and then we interpret it using something called our hyperfeed engine you see in the middle of the slide. So for context, we're assessing some 10,000 aircraft positions uh, messages a second, 10,000 messages a second in the hyperfeed engine. And Hyperfeed's job is essentially to, um, it uses machine learning and algorithms to determine what we can take as trusted data and it rules out anything it determines as erroneous data. 
The end result is the most accurate and comprehensive data in the world that's becoming trusted as a single source of truth for what's happening in the aviation industry. So next slide, please. So you've seen how we capture that data and we're using that essentially to create some of the views I'm going to go through now. So for the purposes of the analysis of what's happened to flight traffic during the pandemic, we've generated a series of graphs and all of the graphs were created using flight totals for a week that were then plotted uh, for the, for the uh, yearly average. So here we can see we have some views plotted for 2019 in blue. So 2019 being a reference year where there was no pandemic. We also have 2020 shown in gold and 2021 shown in orange. So most of the graphs will focus on commercial passenger aircraft worldwide, except for where I've labeled otherwise. So starting off with a big picture overall trends. So in 2019, this blue line you see, we see the typical variation between summer and winter of about 10%. However, in 2020, the gold line, we see the initial drop starting in late January, which was due to flight volume in China rapidly ramping down. Traffic was persistent through February, and then in March, it became a global drop in every region of the world and bottoming out roughly around mid-April in terms of flight volumes. It then slowly recovered into spring and summertime, and then more or less flatlining from August 2020 to the end of the year. And this is what we call a classic U-shaped drop in 2020. So in 2021, the orange line, we see an initial early decrease of traffic due to some lockdowns kicking in. So just after the festive holiday lockdown relaxations, uh, we then saw a rebound at the end of January to the present day. So this slide sort of gives you the idea of the global commercial passenger airlines view. But what I'm about to show you will, will show you how the pandemics impacted different parts of the world, different parts of aviation. And it's certainly been um, a non-uniform recovery. Next slide, please. So let's start with the geographic variations. So here we've got six different regions where we've tracked the commercial passenger flights activity. Starting off with North America, uh, most closely resembles the global average graph I showed just now. So we have that classic U-shaped uh, uh, drop and recovery. We then have flat lining ever since the late summer uh, Northern Hemisphere. And then that flat lining continues into 2021 then a small recovery from February onwards in 2021. So South America has been a different story. It was up year over year at the start of 2020, and then it had a much larger drop than North America, and the recovery has been much, much slower. This is both due to Brazil being hard COVID hit, as well as a large number of countries making up South America, all with varying lockdown and immigration restrictions. Traffic peaked around the holidays in 2020, and flight volume has now slid back in 2021 by about 10 to 15% from that summer peak in South America. Moving on to Europe. So Europe is unique in that it's the only region we've seen where there's been a double dip. So it had the U-shaped recovery like North America, but the European flight schedules are typically much heavier in the summer than they are in the winter. And that winter weakness showed at the end of 2020 and into 2021, where it's well below its summer peak. Moving on to the Middle East, which is very dependent, as we know, on connecting traffic and had a very slow recovery, similar to South America. So the Middle East has recovered steadily throughout 2020, but has flatlined since around the end of that year. So moving on to Asia. So as a whole, we've split Asia into sort of two different stories here. So we broke out China from the overall Asia numbers to give you a distinct China view. But looking at Asia, which does include the China numbers, so we see that early dip due to the dip in China uh, with, with the early onset of, of the COVID, and then an extended dip as the rest of Asia starts closing borders. The recovery got up to around 50 to 60% of flight volume in Asia as a whole throughout the year, 
And then in early 2021, we see another dip before traffic starts to pick back up. China itself, you can see the dip came much, much sooner and was generally much deeper, but the recovery has been very much stronger. So from October onwards, it was back to around 85% of prior year volumes. And right now, the latest China data is showing a recovery back to pre-COVID levels. That is, we're seeing flight volumes right now matching 2029 levels. Next slide, please. So let's look now at different operation types where we see different stories. So on the left here, I have the passenger airline flights within to and from the United States, which is roughly in line with the global and North American numbers on the previous slides. The biggest notable difference is the fair bit of recovery the last few weeks of February and sustained through March, dipping slightly in April. Now on the right hand side of the slide, we have the business aviation. So this is your jet powered turboprops using, oh, sorry, jet powered aircraft and turboprops being used for business aviation. So here we see the recovery in 2020 was much more V shape rather than the uh, extended U shape. Uh, that we see in the commercial airlines side. In the terms of flight volume, there was a much stronger recovery. And by the end of 2020, it was pushing somewhere in the 85 to 90% range from late summer onwards. And 2021 has matched the peak of 2019 and the early part of 2020. So it's been a very strong, robust recovery. And we've seen some dynamic shifts within those numbers too. So there's been less of these corporate in-house flight departments operating and more of a shift to charter as business meetings are relatively light and there's a lack of need for business travel uh, due to those meetings being light. Uh, also, particularly with the closed borders and general concerns about spreading of COVID. And we've also seen uh, some marginal passengers or families who would have otherwise booked first class airline tickets, but are now moving up into the low end of business aviation charter. So that's boosting those numbers on the right hand side. Next slide, please. So similarly, we've seen a very different traffic trend for cargo uh, here on the right side of the slide again is the cargo flights within to and from the United States. So there was no dip at all in 2020 and the growth actually continued throughout the full year, even with the onset of COVID. So the growth was fueled by the expansion of e-commerce or e-shopping and also by the growth of Amazon's own aircraft operations. So in 2021, it continued from where it was after the holiday season and then we had a quick dip and a quick recovery mid-February. We believe this was most probably associated with the severe winter weather that affected uh, Texas and, and, and other surrounding states in the United States that caused that dip. Next slide, please. So another way to look at this non-uniformity is this time by the lengths of flights. So. In this graph, we are color coding the flight lengths and globally comparing 2020 and early 2021 numbers to pre-COVID year of 2019. So the year 2020 started with slight growth in all segments and some stronger growth of about 10% for flights under an hour. The dip in February into March was due flight volumes dropping in China and then really all stage lengths of flights dropping together in March as the whole world starts to shut down due to the now global pandemic. Since then, we've seen a couple of places where the growth based on the stage length has really differentiated itself. So that's where the initial bump in late April into May for the very long haul flights of eight to 16 hours was driven by the passenger airlines starting to utilize converted passenger aircraft for all cargo services, particularly between the United States, Europe, and China, to make up for the lack of belly cargo that uh, belly cargo availability during that hot demand period for uh, cargo. Uh, since sort of late summer, we've seen the group that is flights under four hours have a more robust recovery coming back so now in March to April 2021 to around 60% of what they were previously. Whereas the flights over four hours have had a weaker recovery, largely due to the closed borders and other immigration restrictions. 
Next slide, please. Lastly, let's look at a mix of different aircraft size. So in gold, here is the 2020 and early 2021 flight volumes for commercial passenger airlines activity. Then the blue here on the right hand side, the blue uh, line reflects to the right hand scale and it's a percentage of wide bodies as a fraction of the number of narrow bodies operating. So here we see the wide bodies were hit more by the flying reductions in February and March 2020 as the world closed borders, but then saw a resurgence in late April and May 2020 due to the long, long haul wide body flying of passenger aircraft now fitted to carry only cargo, enabling those passenger airlines an opportunity to still earn revenue in the absence of passengers. Since then, the wide bodies have experienced a dip and a sort of recovery, and it remains to be seen where we end up in terms of the mix in the recovery of long haul flying that is typically done with the wide bodies versus the short haul flying typically done with the narrow bodies on shorter sectors. And these are less likely to experience border control or immigration restrictions. Next slide, please. So final slide, um, in summary, Commercial passenger airlines have leveled off at a modest circa 50% recovery of traffic 19s, uh, traffic, of um, traffic levels in late 2020 compared with 2019. But in February to April 2021, we've seen the recovery steadily grow to around 60% of that 2019 level. However, as, as we've seen, this recovery profile is very diverse geographically some very slow recoveries and some double dips, as well as some strong recoveries in different regions of the world. Other operation types outside of commercial airlines, including both business, aviation and cargo, have seen more substantial recoveries, more robust recoveries, and even growth throughout the pandemic. Different recovery profiles and stage lengths are really split into flights under four hours that recovered a little bit more strongly compared to flights grouped above four hours, uh, including long haul. We've had a weaker recovery due to the lack of long haul travel due to immigration and border restrictions. We've also seen that multiple changes to the mix of aircraft size, and that's really impacting airport planning for how many wide body gates, narrow body gates they have. So that really impacts in terms of utilization as the wide bodies came in carrying all cargo, but then those flights were reduced as more typical cargo aircraft came back. And now we're seeing the stronger recovery of the narrow body aircraft. So that's the uneven recovery landscape mapped and visualized used in FlightAware data. And that concludes my analysis. So I believe I'm now handing over to Florian. Yeah, thanks a lot, Toby. That was uh, very insightful and thanks for setting the scene. Now we're going to talk about how this uh, road to recovery affects the capacity inside um, the terminal. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned earlier, as always, we focus on helping airports understand passenger flow inside the terminal, how the queues form, how can you increase the throughput of your um, infrastructure and so on. This is used by over 90 airports across the globe, both uh, big and small. Next slide, please. And today we're gonna focus specifically on the, uh, the check-in operation. And maybe just as a short introduction, why do airports work with us in the check-in area specifically? They try to address challenges or questions such as, how do I optimally utilize my check-in desks, especially during peak times? How do I measure process times along the different stages of a check-in process and optimize it? How do I uh, tweak and improve the check-in setup, whether it's the queue layout or the self-service infrastructure, measuring whether one-step or two-step processes make more sense. And last but not least, in the dynamic between airline ground handler and airport, how do I measure and verify service level agreements with unbiased data? Next slide, please. And for, just for you to be aware of how we do that, we mount our own sensors in the terminal ceiling and I'm sure you've traveled through an airport where our sensors are in the ceiling and capturing uh, data. These are just three examples from different airports across the globe. Next slide, please. And the way how these sensors work is they look down from the ceiling and based on a 3D image through depth perception, an algorithm on the sensor determines what is a person and converts that person into an anonymous, anonymous dot. The only thing then leaving the sensor, the only information leaving the sensor 
are the parameters of where that anonymous person is and where they're moving. So completely privacy compliant. Next slide, please. So let's look at a real life uh, situation. What you see here is a uh, check-in hall of an international uh, European gateway and passengers enter the terminal from the bottom. Uh, we have two check-in rows here with 16 desks each. We're gonna focus on the lower part and passengers then move through the e-gates through immigration and security control. What you see here is an international long haul flight and you can nicely see how the, the queue is forming. This is, uh, visual, this is real data back from um, January 2020 before the pandemic started, so when everything was still normal. So let's take a snapshot, um, next slide please, to look and highlight uh, a couple of things. Um, next slide please. We see here on the, in the bottom, there is a mini queue forming just before the main queue. That's because there was, uh, there's self-service infrastructure, in this case, kiosks, um, where passengers can uh, uh, take care of part of the check-in process themselves, which then speeds up the baggage drop at the, at the proper desks. Uh, we also see how the, almost the entire surface area in this uh, check-in row is fully utilized. It's a very effective utilization of, of the space. Now let's fast forward one year to, to the present and see how check -in, the check-in process has changed. Next slide, please. Uh, based on our, our discussions and observations with, uh, with the airports we work with, there are six key factors that have affected the check-in process over the past months. First, health certificates need to be checked and verified. This is either done at the uh, check-in desks or at the boarding gate, sometimes even twice, but it adds around an average of 30 to 120 seconds per passenger. Secondly, Entry requirements into certain destinations, actually a lot of destinations, have gotten much more stringent. So a higher share of passengers now needs a visa or some other sort of special paperwork. And checking this takes anywhere from kind of 60 to 240 seconds. Third, um, in quite a few cases, we've seen self-check-in infrastructure temporarily disabled because it cannot cope with the new workflows presented by uh, number one and two that I mentioned here. And in line with that is number four, that we see a lower share of online checked-in passengers that bypass the check-in desk completely, especially on some short-haul destinations where you would previously have up to 50% of passengers uh, checking in online, only carrying hand luggage, and therefore bypassing check-in completely. That share has dropped pretty much to zero, which puts more pressure on the check-in infrastructure. Fifth is physical distancing. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, a single passenger just needs more surface area around them nowadays. And then last, but definitely not least, is a change in passenger ar arrival profile that we've been noticing. And I think this is very important to understand, so let's just zoom in on that for a second. Next slide, please. What you see here is the arrival profile, meaning when did passengers arrive at the airport for the flight that we just looked at, both in February of 2020 before the pandemic and now March 2021 uh, during pandemic uh, operations. And you can clearly see how the red line, meaning this year, moves to the left of the red li uh, blue line. And what this means is that the pa a higher share of passengers is arriving at the airport earlier than they used to. That can be due to a variety of reasons. It can be um, airlines asking passengers to show up earlier to avoid a late closure of check-in and therefore a delay. But it can also be um, travelers who haven't been uh, flying in a while and don't know how, what's the situation now at the airport. But what this means in practice, and this is very important to understand, is that let's take a short haul flight where previously passengers would have arrived maybe 90 minutes before departure at the airport. If for that same flight, the same number of passengers now arrives on average 30 minutes earlier, meaning 120 instead of 90 minutes before departure. They spend more time at the airport, and it means that for the same flight, with the same number of passengers, you have up to 40% additional passenger passengers in the terminal at any given point in time. Now, this can have a lot of implications, such as seat capacity throughout the terminal, evacuation regulations, hygiene for toilets, et cetera, cleaning cycles, or the availability of gastronomy. Let me just illustrate that in a very simple example. Next slide, please. 
You see here a photo of a bus for remote bay operations, and the operator has blocked every other seat. Now, if you still put in, even if you're not running a flight at full capacity or the bus at full capacity, if you bring in a lot of passengers, this means it's going to get full very, very quickly. And I think you get my point now. The same thing can happen in your terminal operation. Next slide, please. Now let's go to the, back to the same flight that we looked at earlier and look at what it's like um, now in April 2021. Let's play the video. Again, same check-in hall, same flight. You can see how passengers are starting to arrive, um, how the queue is starting to form. And let's just pause here and again look at a snapshot. Next slide, please. Um, two things I want to highlight. First, all of a sudden, on the right-hand side, you see a very long queue forming throughout the terminal past several check-in rows. Why is that? It's because um, here they've uh, started a, a check of health certificates before you join the main queue. And then secondly, you can also see how there's a much less effective utilization of space uh, because the queue has now kind of been separated in a different way. And on top of that, the kiosks have been disabled. Currently, this is not a major issue because on this particular day, the airport was running at about 8% um, passenger volumes of 2019 levels. But just imagine now what will happen if, that, if the number of passengers goes back to 40, 50, or even 60%. All of a sudden, you will have queues all over the place and you can run into a capacity crunch fairly, fairly quickly. So what does this now mean as a terminal operator? What do you have to pay attention uh, to over the, over the coming months on the road to recovery. Next slide, please. Six main points that I want to highlight. First, stakeholder collaboration. And I know I might sound a bit like a broken record because this has probably had been on every other presentation giving at an airport conference over the past years, but it is more important than ever that airlines, ground handlers, and airports talk together because the, the, the situation is as dynamic as it's ever been. Secondly, you got to anticipate bottlenecks. You will, just like in the past, uh, pre-pandemic, you will have bottlenecks, but they're probably going to be in a very different place than you used to have them. And you need the data to understand where they're forming so that you can be proactive um, about it. And speaking of 2019, you also want to avoid going back to the same playbook or the same mode of operation that you used to run your terminal ops pre-pandemic. You don't want to ramp back up to the same uh, playbook that you used to have before you ramp down because some airlines, some destinations are going to have more challenges and difficulties than others and you want to account for that. You want to reshuffle your check-in desks, for example. Fourth, you want to consciously plan your queue layouts. If you don't do it, the passengers will do it for you and you want to avoid that. In the example I just gave you with the long straight line forming past several check-in desks, we observe that it doesn't form the same way every day. Sometimes it goes around the corner, sometimes it goes out the door um, because it's not managed by the airport. So passengers just queue up uh, however they like. And then fifth, you wanna measure, plan and control your actions. You might be uh, working with additional floor walkers. You might be putting up kind of like a, um, a pop-up baggage drop somewhere else in the terminal. And you wanna understand how this affects your operations, whether it's helpful, and you also want to monitor your process times so that you can interfere before it's too late. And then last but not least, a lot of airports have, have lost a lot of talents, have shrunk their workforce over the past year. And we think it's very important that you learn from others ahead of the curve. When the pandemic started, um, a lot of Asian airports especially adapted fairly quickly to, to, the, to the new mode of operation due to their experience. And just like um, it was helpful to learn what's happening um, in, in some of those airports, also now there are airports that are further along on the road to recovery and learning from those examples and avoiding some mistakes is, is crucial. I very much appreciate your time. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to the Q&A and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thanks. Over to Christian. Okay, thanks Florian. Um... So super interesting so far. I think we've seen, you know, how the crisis has been developing in different parts of the world, and and you know what kind of impact uh, has it created, and is it expected to create indoor? Um, so what I want to focus on in the time left is to see, you know, how does all of this affect the situation on our side? 
Uh, next slide, please. So the, this, the exact same effects that Florian was actually just talking about um, also uh, do have an effect outside. And uh, we'll be sharing a little bit of information about a research that we did that actually proves uh, the case. Um, so one of the main things that we are looking at, obviously, is, is turnarounds. And some of the things that we've observed already uh, in 2020 is that turnaround durations have increased. And some of the reasons for this increase of turnaround durations is obviously that you know, if you count a parked aircraft under a turnaround, there were much more parked, parked aircraft during the, the, the COVID peaks. Um, so that had a major impact on turnaround times. Um, but besides that, also the aircrafts that were in operation had longer turnaround times, uh, especially due to longer boarding processes. And these, uh, again, were a result of physical distancing, uh, like in the terminal, people queuing up longer uh, and, and the process taking, uh, taking longer, therefore. Also, in, uh, during boarding processes, often uh, COVID test checks have to be uh, validated. Or now that we're moving into a situation where more and more people get vaccinated and vaccination is even becoming a requirement for travel, um, vaccinations might have to be checked also at, at the boarding stage. Um, another reason for longer turnarounds is actually uh, more frequent and uh, more rigid cleaning processes. Obviously, uh, airlines and airports have been working very hard to win the trust of the passengers and to show them that it's safe to fly um, and making sure that the aircrafts are super clean and are cleaned after each uh, leg has been one of the reasons, uh, uh, one of the ways for them to do that. Um, but more cleaning and more uh, rigid cleaning also means that it takes longer. One of the last things that we've seen uh, affecting turnaround durations um, has actually been that obviously airports, airlines, ground handlers have had to cut costs. And especially on the ground handling side, which is very labor intensive, uh, a lot of people have been let go or have been furloughed. Um, and that means that there's typically less people available uh, to, to do the same kind of work. Um, and since also a lot of people have been laid off, and have moved on to other jobs, especially now you know traffic is picking back up. Um, people need to be rehired, and these people might not be experienced. Um, so we also see a, sort of an experience leak that has occurred during the COVID, cri COVID crisis. Uh, next slide, please. So if you then look at those turnaround durations, uh, we've done an analysis based on uh, data kindly provided by our friends from FlightAware. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at the 84 biggest airports in the world. Um, to see you know, when do aircraft arrive uh, to an airport based on the aircraft registration number and when do they leave. And the time in between, um, we've, for simplification reasons, just said you know, that's the turnaround duration. And we've looked at two different time periods in 2019 and 2020. And as you can see, um, in 2019, the, the, the turnaround duration in these two periods was more or less equal. And in 2020, they were at both periods higher um, and in April even much higher than, uh, than in July. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, what does that then mean? What are the effects of these longer turnaround durations? And the thing that we've particularly looked into is basically simulating um, what effect it has on stand capacity. Um, so what we did is we created a simulation model where there were a few inputs, uh, where the first one is the turnaround time uh, as just presented. Um, the second input is actually the number of stands. Um, and the third input is the arrival rate. So how many flights are arriving per hour into an, any given airport? Um, obviously, we had these inputs for the pre-COVID situation and for the COVID situation in order for us to be able to compare. Now, the output of the simulation was inbound aircraft waiting time during peak hours. So in a pre-COVID situation, an, an aircraft comes into uh, an airport, and if there's a stand available, you know, it goes directly to the stand. And it has you know zero minutes of waiting times. If the aircraft comes in and there is no stand available because all the stands are occupied by uh, aircrafts that are either parked or turning around, then this aircraft has to wait until one of the stands becomes available, and then it can go there. And the time in between, that is sort of the number of minutes of inbound holding time that we're looking at as a measure of uh, stand capacity shortage. Uh, next slide, please. So then let's look at the output of the simulation. And um, what we can see uh, in the graph here is that in the initial situation where there's 0% recovery, so the full COVID scenario, 
uh, which means given number of stands uh, with fairly long turnaround durations, uh, but with not so high uh, aircraft arrival rates. Um, there is actually no uh, inbound holding time, which is expected because there's hardly any operations. And it's the same effect as Florian showed us. You know, if you have that flight um, with all these people queuing up, if you have only one flight, it's not a problem. But then let us look at what happens if we can uh, start to simulate the recovery steps. So what we did is we simulated recovery in 10% in increments all the way up to full recovery. Um, and what happens as we take these steps, the number of stands uh, stays the same. Um, what we did is we uh, relatively reduced the, or sorry, increased the aircraft arrival rate back towards the pre-COVID level. So with each 10% step, we also increased the number of aircraft that are arriving into the airport. The second thing we did is that the, the parked aircraft, so the ones that take uh, that are not in operation, those are the ones that are also um, uh, step per step are being reduced. Um, however, the turnaround times for the active turns, we kept the same. And the reason for that is that the reasons why these turnaround times have increased, they are most likely to stay the same. So increased cleaning regimes, physical distancing, the checks of vaccinations, et cetera, et cetera will remain for the foreseeable future. And that's also one of the reasons why we start to see an, uh, uh, an effect kick in uh, around 70 to 80% recovery. Because there, if we start to look, we can actually see this line shooting up, um, which actually means that at 80, 70 to 80% recovery from that point onwards, um, the number of stands in relation to the longer turnaround times in relation to the increased aircraft arrival rates is not going to be sufficient. And we will see that during peak hours, aircraft will start to uh, we have to wait after arrival in order for a gate to become available. And at 70% or at 80%, it's, you know, we're talking about three minutes, which is maybe manageable. Um, however, at 100% recovery, we're talking about 30 minutes, which basically means a fully congested airport, because this means in a peak hour where there might be 50, 60 flights arriving, each aircraft will actually have a 30 minute wait time. That actually means that, you know, your airport will fully uh, congest and fully uh, block up if, if that would be to, to occur. Next slide, please. So also we looked a little bit at, you know, can we find any global differences? And here you can see a visualization of the recovery steps and, and uh, uh, the increase of this waiting time uh, per airport that we included in our set. Um, there was a really small difference where Europe seemed to be a little bit less sensitive to the effect than uh, North America and Asia, um, but not significantly. We did also look at, is there a different effect for larger airports versus smaller airports, or is there a different effect for airports that are already congested versus airports that might have some capacity available, but all of these didn't result in any uh, statistically significant results. Next slide, please. So I already mentioned that you know congestion is a major problem, and and if we were actually to reach that level where each aircraft in the peak hour has to wait 30 minutes, then that's unmanageable situation. But if we just make some calculations, uh, if this scenario would hold true, and you would it would happen for each flight in a year, um, that would mean that actually we get an an additional 44 and a half million minutes of inbound delays. Uh, the direct costs uh, associated with the kerosene burn of all these aircraft waiting. Uh, would be more than 114 million dollars per year um, and, and that doesn't even take into account the indirect cost of a delay minute which would be on top of this and also there's a sustainability effect uh, because all this kerosene that's get burned is also avoidable co2 that's actually being emitted and coming out of the crisis i think you know the focus from airports airlines is very much on two things uh, which is their cost levels and luckily on sustainability uh, which are both negatively being affected by this effect. Uh, next slide, please. So then what can we do about it? Um, if you look at the model that we presented, uh, there's a few levers that we can turn, right? Um, the first was the, the number of aircraft stands. Unfortunately, it takes uh, many or a few years to build an aircraft stand. So to start building aircraft stands to solve the problem, we, we just don't have the time. Uh, and basically, frankly, we actually also don't have the money. Um, so this lever actually is, is hard to use. Um, the other lever was the aircraft arrival rate. Um, 
well, we're actually, you know, trying to get aircrafts to fly again. And that's something that should be good for the industry. So artificially reducing the number of flights is also an undesired solution. So the only option actually to manage this problem and to mitigate these effects is to look into the turnaround times. Um, and, and, you know, when you look at this turnaround times, there's a few points that we would like to make is where we say you can't manage what you, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, and that's a point that Florian also make. If you want to improve a situation, you first have to understand it and you have to look how is it evolving um, in order to be able to find areas for improvement. Um, this can be done in different ways. So you can you know, use historical data from your turnarounds and, and find patterns and find areas for optimization. But you can also use it in real time where if you start to see deviations in your turnarounds that you can act directly and minimize the impact on, uh, on the turnaround duration rather than that those affect uh, uh, affect the, the, the ultimate uh, on-time performance. And the last point we want to make in relation to this is that even though it seems that we're on a path towards recovery, um, there's still quite a lot of uncertainty and there's quite some fluctuations also expected, I think. Um, so having real-time data will actually be, be more important even because of that reason, um, because there's no standard necessarily. So being able to adjust to the situation in real-time uh, will be more important than ever. Um, so also from my side, thanks a lot for your time today and looking forward to any questions. I think now we are ready to move to the Q&A uh, session. I would love uh, to thank everybody and every one of our speakers. And uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, attendees, uh, registrants, uh, if you have any questions to um, ask them in the Q&A. And we will uh, answer it within like, we'll spend around five minutes, I think, on answering the questions. Let's have a look. I think we uh, currently have one at the moment. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, we got a question to uh, Florian from Sovis, um, from Jose. Um, Florian, don't you think it is important to include as important stakeholders to coordinate with uh, health agencies and the immigrations due to the controls they need to do? Yeah, no, absolutely, you're right, Jose. I mean, when I, I, when I mentioned uh, airports, ground handlers and airlines, obviously that's not, a, not an exhaustive list that includes uh, border control authorities that uh, um, includes, but the police, maybe the um, security screening provider, cleaning uh, uh, facility management, and so on. And I think what's important that they they all kind of rely on the same data, that everyone speaks the, the same language, and not everyone has a, a different uh, different game plan. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Florian. Um... Does anybody else uh, got other questions to our other participants from FlightAware or from ASIA? Oh, we also got one more to Florian oh, and Christian. So we uh, continue uh, with service and then move into the question to ASIA. So Florian, can you tell us about what uh, Asian airports uh, did in order to handle the problem of more people in the airports? Yeah, so you mean more people in uh, a higher number of passengers in the airport, or you mean um, uh, at the on, uh, at the start of the pandemic? Well, anyway, so I think we need to differentiate China from, from the one. of Asia. You know, <laughs> the, the the numbers that uh, Toby was showing in China is predominantly probably ninety nine percent is is domestic traffic. And uh, there, they're able to to reduce uh, operate on a on a much, let's say, less impacted um, uh, constraints because this, uh, the situation is is much more control under control domestically than if you're looking at cross border travel. I think other parts of Asia are probably still dealing with uh, a lot of the very similar challenges that we see in cross border travel in, in other parts of the world. All right. Thanks a lot. And I think we're now moving to um, Asaya. Uh, so question to Christian. 
um, in your study on stand occupancy, did you consider um, arrival OTP or departure OTP, as well as any stand closures for maintenance? Thanks, uh, Prishamak. Uh, nice to have you here again. Um, so in the model that we used, we actually assumed that each aircraft will arrive and depart on time. Um, and we did not assume any stand closures. Um, so we basically assumed sort of the ideal scenario, if you will. Um, so you could argue that on top of that, if you actually have some stand closures, that in the situation would obviously be worsened because you have less available parking stands. And also both uh, arrival and departures delays would actually sort of disrupt the schedule. And that also, oh, that always costs capacity. Um, so we did not consider those things. If you would add those things into the mix, it would make the, the modeling a bit more complex. Uh, and it would, to some degree at least, uh, worsen the, the, the effects, is, is, the, is my expectation at least. And then I guess uh, maybe to, to, to go into this as well, I think if you include this into the model, then um, you would probably reach a level that, that Eurocontrol also shared some, some days ago in their study where they said that they see a capacity crunch at airports uh, within the within the 60 to 70 percent recovery rate and I guess that would be something that we could also see with our model yeah. all right and I think we got a uh, few more minutes to answer the last question which we still have in the Q&A uh, I think it also goes to Christian uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, regarding new aircraft stands, uh, parking, parking positions, etc. What about putting into practice what airports have done with great success for mega events such as the FIFA World Cup, uh, UEFA Euro, etc. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, and I think to a certain extent it is what uh, many airports have done. So uh, back in my days, when I was at Schiphol still, we had the nuclear security summit in Amsterdam. And, and then also there were so many planes from, from government leaders and their, their entourage that, that we closed the runway to park the aircraft, actually. Um, so, you know, for, that, that's a good short-term solution, I think. And I think that's also a solution that has been used by many airports during the COVID crisis. Um, however, you know, if you start to go back into operation, typically you need that runway. Um, because it's it's super expensive to have a runway and to maintain a runway for an airport in the first place. So if you go back to a scenario with, with, with more traffic, you, I would expect that airport to need that runway. Um, and unless it's for like a short time incidental usage, it would be difficult. Now there is obviously creative solutions. So I, I think many airports would be able to squeeze out another few stands uh, out of the infrastructure and have some creative parking options. Um, and, and that might be partially the solution to this, but it also always comes at a cost because it might mean more remote handling, which means more busing, which means more cost. Uh, it also has an effect on on-time performance. And to me personally, it's just such a shame that just when we're you know getting back to uh, well the good old days, I would say, um, you get these extra negative uh, effects kicking in, and and that's what I think we should try to to avoid. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. So I think uh, we haven't got much time left for further uh, live questions. I think if uh, anybody else got other questions to our participants, uh, you can still reach out. Um, oh, actually, there is still one more popped up. Let's see if we can <laughs> quickly answer this one as well. Uh, mm -hmm, um, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. To be very honest, I'm not 100% uh, familiar with what Warsaw did uh, during the, the Euro 2012. Um, but like I said, I, I think there is options for creative parking positions, uh, but they typically come at a cost yeah, uh, as and, well. And for example, I mean, yes, if you have an airport that has maybe some not so used capacity or, or, or tarmac, um, okay. But if you look at the likes of London City, of Rio de Janeiro, of uh, Sao Paulo Guarulhos, uh, uh, um, um, the, the, the local airport, uh, or, or Toronto City, or even other airports that, that, that kind of have a capacity issue already um, from a pure tarmac, like concrete perspective. So I guess you are making a very good point here. 
but it is really dependent on the airport itself. All right, so thank you for answering the questions. I think that, um, one second, uh, I think that uh, we can still um, answer if you, if you have any, please send it over. Uh, you can contact any of our speakers who have been presenting today for you um, and write down their contact details. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Reboot Aviation. And you can uh, also reach us out over there uh, with any questions and also uh, follow us for uh, further webinars, which we're gonna have uh, next month as well. Uh, we are running them on a monthly basis. Uh, so uh, if you joined us a little bit late, uh, no worries, you didn't miss anything. We're gonna upload uh, the video on uh, YouTube and to our uh, LinkedIn page of this webinar. You're gonna have the recording. And uh, yes, feel free to reach out. And uh, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we're gonna have a quick uh, quiz uh, in the end of this webinar and we will be happy if you um, take it. And yes, uh, I think, uh, that's about it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anna. Thank Appreciate you very it. much, everyone, for participating. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.